So there's some huge news across the AI landscape today, including for better or for worse on the intersection of AI and war. I'll put that one at the end in case you want to skip it. I know that recent events have been hard to watch, to say the least, but there's some good news in the AI world. The first is that Anthropic seemingly makes a breakthrough in AI research and AI interpretability. The reason this is important is that the AI brain, the neural nets that make these LLM models and other models work so well, they're hard to understand. They're black boxes of a sort. They take in massive amounts of information and over time with training, get better and better at predicting certain results, how to produce images, how to produce words and text, how to predict certain biological structures such as proteins and DNA, etc. But the scary thing about this has been is that we don't fully understand what happens inside. We don't understand exactly how it learns. So here's an announcement by Anthropic AI. The fact that most individual neurons are uninterpretable presents a serious roadblock to mechanistic understanding of language models. We demonstrate a method for decomposing groups of neurons into interpretable features with the potential to move past that roadblock. And they're hoping that in the future, this could lead to the ability to certify that models are safe for adoption. It's much easier to tell if something is safe if you can understand how it works. Here, here. We'll do a full dive into this to really understand what it is that they figured out. But in a nutshell, one neuron in this, these neural nets could be in charge of, they could respond to multiple unrelated things. It's like if you have guests coming over, so you take all the crap that's out and you shove it into one drawer, regardless of what that thing is, you know, in hopes of cleaning up for the guests. Seems like neural nets do the same thing. And this, it seems, is due to superposition. Models compressing many rare concepts into a small number of neurons. They think that they're able to get these models to organize stuff a little bit more transparently, a little bit more easily understood for humans. So a big day for AI safety. Another big news, Microsoft may be coming out with its first AI chip in 2023. And they're not the only ones. NVIDIA's massive revenue growth that was reached by providing GPUs, the chips that make AI, amongst other things, work. Well, it got more and more people interested in producing their own. So Microsoft is one, Amazon, Google are following suit, as well as OpenAI has been talking about potentially producing their own chips. You guys came out with a chip act a while ago that in part subsidizes the companies to potentially produce these chips on US soil. The goal is to not rely on Taiwan to produce all the chips. But speaking of AI safety, not everyone is super duper happy about where everything's going. Protesters decry Meta's irreversible proliferation of AI. But others say open source is the only way to make AI trustworthy. So as you can see here, these people aren't too happy with Meta, aka Facebook, producing all the open source models because they're worried about a doomsday scenario. And it seems like they number in the dozens, or maybe one or two dozen, I don't know. They also seem very happy to be there. Now, maybe it's just me, but I feel like a lot of people that are saying that they're concerned about the annihilation of the human race due to AI, it just seems like they're not too concerned about it. They're kind of going about their day, they seem pretty relaxed, pretty happy, going about their life as usual. And aside from some mean tweets here and there, they don't seem like they're really taking any drastic action to prevent this from happening. But it's good, at least they're not on TikTok all day. And now from one extreme to the other, from the young and concerned to the older and, ah, it's all nonsense, Charlie Munger says AI is getting too much hype, more hype than it deserves. Now, Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's right-hand man. Very smart, very well known for coming up with certain mental models or, or ways of making decisions or thinking through how to approach certain things. The important thing to understand here is that Buffett and Munger get called dinosaurs like every year for, for decades and decades, and they keep winning in the investment games. It's not necessarily because they understand these technologies better. It's just that they're always looking for a good deal in stocks. Nothing that is in the public's attention, that is hyped, that people think will grow, they're generally not going to be that interested it. They're looking for something that they call blood in the streets. When people are so convinced that an industry or company is just dead and gone and the stock price reflects that, that's when they come in and they buy up like half of it. That's been the strategy for them for a long, long time and it's been extremely, extremely successful. They've been saying that about crypto as it's been going up and up and up and up and up. They're like, this is stupid, this is stupid, this is stupid. And of course, when it crashed down here, they continue to say so. It's important to understand that these little spikes, they represent the hype cycle. The hype cycle in 2016, 2017, the 2020s, 2021. So this is people getting excited. He's saying that this is happening to AI. Buffett here says that this new artificial intelligence generative AI is something that he doesn't understand and that it's an incredible technological advance. That's an important thing to understand. When bubbles or euphoria or hype like this forms, these guys are usually on a sideline saying, hey, don't be stupid, don't gamble. People call them out of touch 
and dinosaurs. And then when they're crashing down, and when everything comes crashing down, usually Munger and Buffett tend to win out because they're holding on to stable investments. My point is separate out when they're talking about the hype cycles versus the actual underlying technology. These guys understand hype cycles a lot more than most, and they ignore them. But as both of them say, a lot of the new technology they don't understand. They're not really commenting on the technology, just the stock valuations. OpenAI is considering developing its own AI chips as well as some wearable tech that is AI powered. And also Sam Altman backs Teens AI startup automating browser native workflows. So these are the AI agents that we keep talking about. And these guys, it looks like what they did is they took a Chrome-like browser, Chromium-based browser, and they sort of tweaked it to make it more friendly to AI agents. You might have seen Microsoft Paper. I did a, did a video on Microsoft Paper where they showed how AI agents powered by GPT-4 with Vision can go on Amazon, research products, buy products. It can go online, research recipes, figure out what the actual things that you need for the recipe are, the ingredients, kind of extract that out of the page and then, and then print that page out, etc. GPT-4 with Vision can navigate the web pretty well. The only question is now how, like what is the actual sort of action space, right? Like we use the keyboard and mouse. What is ChatGPT going to use to navigate the web? Now, interestingly, Microsoft has this RPA thing that a lot of people pointed out in the comments, robotic process automation. And it's part of a number of things that they have that actually I was not aware of. Originally called Flow, but also called Power Automation, Power Automate. Then there's Desktop Automation, or I guess it's called Power Automate Desktop. There's a bunch of different stuff kind of under the same umbrella that kind of falls under this idea of RPA, robotic process automation, which is a capability in Power Automate. Again, I feel like they're trying to figure out how to structure this and present this correct because it used to be flow, now it's this, now it's that. But whatever you want to call it, it's kind of this idea of automating certain tasks on the computer, whether that's on your desktop or on your browser. As you can see here, they're beginning to add AI features, GPT powered bot building tools and conversation boosters. And already we're seeing that slowly kind of be available for preview. So as you can see here, power virtual agents. So they have things that help with, for example, customer service. They have things that help with going through finding information on the web, let's say, scraping that information, putting that into an Excel spreadsheet, et cetera. Now, as I've said quite a few times on this channel, I think this is the big thing. This is where a lot of the stuff is going. The ability to create your little bot, your little AI agent that can go and then intelligently go about completing the mission that you set for it will really drastically affect, well, human labor, how we do stuff, work in general. Before, if I wanted to go and let's say do some research online and then organize it into an Excel spreadsheet, give it some sort of a rating system, et cetera, I would have to do that. Or I would have to get another human to do that for me if I can find somebody on Fiverr or whatever. We are a lot closer to that being automated. So here they have a test bot, for example. It looks like it's going to help answer HR questions like, what is your maternal leave policy? So for example, one of the things Microsoft was talking about is just you let this bot loose on your sort of database of documents for the HR department. It kind of goes through, reads everything, and then it's able to answer those questions. It becomes like a helpful assistant about your HR department. You can do the same thing for customer service. You can do the same thing for employee onboarding, whatever. And so people are eyeing this technology and Microsoft is running headfirst at it. Looks like Sam Altman with OpenAI is also doing the same thing as well. So it looks like these two guys are doing something that's a Chromium-based browser instances that use its tech to read on-screen content and control the browser similarly to a human in order to complete various steps of the workflow. So again, we have GPT-4 with Vision that has a lot of the capability to interact with it. We already have all the browsers and Excels and stuff like that made. The question is, what's going to connect those two? Is it going to be whatever these two guys come up with? Is it going to be Microsoft's Power Automate or Flow or RPA, whatever they, they're going to end up calling it? I've used Zapier for a long time. Yeah, they see here that it pioneered the API integration technology. So this was like the old school way of doing it. In fact, I mean, still very powerful and looks like Zapier is trying to integrate as much of this stuff in its workflows as possible. So keep an eye on the space because this is where like a lot of people are focused on because if we're able to have you know, ChatGPT do a lot of the same things that a human can do on a desktop computer. I mean, if you think through that a little bit, it kind of is a big deal. You know, saying it's a disruptive technology, I think is underselling it. I think it's just fundamentally changes what we perceive human labor to be because you're no longer 
clicking or moving or dragging or typing, you're setting high-level goals. You now have an army of workers that you're managing. Induced AI is certainly not alone. Chances are you have seen several similar modern robotic process automation concepts floating around on X and Hacker News in recent months. But Sharma pointed out several factors that set induced AI apart from others. Induced AI can run multiple tasks simultaneously and it's fully remote, for instance. Being able to have like multiple instances that are remote, that are running, and you just have some sort of a on-screen view of it as it's going about your bidding, building your business for you or doing your job for you or whatever, having potentially an unlimited amount of these instances, it's getting crazy. It's getting nutty. Stick around. So here's a link I found. So this is BPMD. So I'm not familiar with this company, but they had a pretty cool chart here. So they're talking about these RPAs, robotic process automation. They've talked about like they have an introduction, what it means, how to utilize, etc. But this is a pretty cool chart that I think is kind of illustrates where we are. So step one is RPA 1.0. So what is that? So it's just to improve workers' productivity with the help of automated tools. The robot doesn't do anything, does not perform the actual task, but assists the human workforce with their efforts, right? So they're saying like a calculator or, for example, some sort of an autocomplete or some code suggestions, etc. Then we have RPA 2.0, unassisted RPA. So here the RPA, these, this robotic automation, is set to carry out end-to-end -end tasks. RPA 3.0 is autonomous RPA. So these end-to-end -end tasks are fully automated and the human workforce will be focused on their efforts of exception handling. So when stuff goes off the rails, humans come in and be like, uh, what did you do? Let me see. And of course, RPA 4.0 is cognitive RPA. And this final category sees RPA integrated with AI technologies such as machine learning, voice recognition, computer vision, text analytics, natural language processing, and natural language generation. And so this will allow your robots to self-manage and self-heal. At this stage, the objective for the human workforce is to increase the scope of automation. I, I think the objective at this point is just to kick back. I think there's going to be a point where the human workforce doing stuff is more of a liability then. I think at that point will be a liability to this automation, these AI agents. But the big thing that I'm trying to kind of point out on this channel, like, is, is this isn't science fiction or some weird presentation to invest in some faraway technology that may or may not come to pass. We're somewhere here. We're unlocking this end-to-end -end task completion. I, I, I've seen this happen already. I've, I've shown examples of this happening on, a chat, on this channel. Now, it's not great. It's not perfect, but it's real. Next is everything's handled and it's kind of like human in the loop. So the human kind of oversees it and helps and they sit there, but the robots, the LLMs, the AIs are doing all the work. Like we don't have this yet, but, but you know, ask me again in a few months. So this is the space to watch, I think, these autonomous AI agents or whatever word you want to use to describe it. And if you're interested in stuff like this, click subscribe. My goal on this channel will be to make it accessible to everybody, regardless of your tech background, to get people to start using it, learning about it, be aware of it. This thing is coming whether you like it or not. Might as well be ahead of the curve on this one. And so this is the Induced AI website really fast. Looks like they have invites that are going out. So if you sign up, like it looks like 20 invites are rolling out in four hours and 40 minutes. Induced agents run 24 seven in the cloud to complete manual tasks on a browser with human-like reasoning capabilities, launch an army of virtual agents. Just thought I would mention this in case you are interested. Then we have Lava, large language and vision assistance. So if you've seen all the cool things that GPT-4 with vision can do, this is an open source, completely free competitor to it. And so far it's looking pretty good. You can test, I'll, I'll leave a link down below to the web page is going to have all these links as well, some explanations. But this thing is looking pretty cool. It's open source. It's free. And so their goal is to build a multimodal GPT-4 level chatbot. We're going to have to do a deep dive on this in another video, but but it's looking pretty powerful. People behind it are University of Wisconsin-Madison, Microsoft Research, and Columbia University. Sometimes I just look at pictures of the Earth from space and I marvel at how beautiful it is. Well, like I said, we'll dive deep into this in the future. One interesting thing that stood out to me here is that so Lava here says the punchline of the meme appears in smaller text at the bottom. I mean, it's not the real earth, but how beautiful it, it, it all is. Uh, so this to me suggests that this is in its training data. So it knows that there's missing context here at the bottom and actually it's filling it in, which does that suggest that GPT-4 actually gets what this is without that or that it also has that context that we're just not seeing it. Either way, it's going to be interesting to kind of go through this and see what the heck is happening. And finally, we get to AI and war. Now, unfortunately, 
AI is too good of a technology not to be used for war. Really fast, one of the sort of concepts that gets introduced a lot in, you know, for example, airplane warfare, air warfare, aka dogfights, where, you know, used to be called when two ace pilots would battle each other in the skies. I think they refer to that as dogfighting. I'm sure that's actually now that I think about it, probably outdated terminology. But, you know, it's this loop of you sort of observe the situation around you, you orient yourself, right? So how are you positioned for the solution? How's the, uh, you know, in this case, they're looking at competition. So this also for business, right? Then you decide what to do, you act, and then you observe, right? So from observe back to observe, you can think of it as like from observe back to observe. This is a loop that you keep doing, right? So you're basically doing stuff, getting information, thinking about it, deciding what to do, doing stuff, getting information, and thinking about it. Here is 60 Minutes. This came out in the last 24 hours. Let's take a look really fast. So this is 60 Minutes came out just uh, not that long ago. I think less than 24 hours ago. Here's General Milley, Miley on the future of warfare. Take Character a listen. Of war. Our military is going to have to change uh, if we are going to continue to, to be superior uh, to every other military on earth. Uh, and it's through that degree of strength, that military strength, and the willingness to use it, that I think you maintain that international order uh, and that you maintain the peace. There have been several periods in history that have transformed military operations or armed warfare. Where does artificial intelligence sit? That's huge. In fact, I've uh, referred to it as the mother of all technology sort of thing. So the ability to make decisions, so-called OODA loop, to observe, orient, direct, and act loop, to do that faster than your opponent, uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes gives you a decisive advantage. So uh, Napoleon would oftentimes wake up at two in the morning to issue his orders to his marshals, and they'd be on the move before the British woke up for tea. And, and you know, if you think about the German... Uh, operational doctrine of blitzkrieg. That's what that did. So artificial intelligence allows you uh, to absorb massive amounts of complex information very rapidly uh, to assist uh, humans in their decision making. And theoretically, you can actually program the computers to make the decisions themselves, uh, which would be a whole new world at that point. He mentioned blitzkrieg in there. There's this book I want to read called Blitz. There's this book I want to read called Blitz. Apparently, it talks about how during World War II in Germany, it seems like there's a lot of methamphetamine use and how maybe that laid the foundation for some of the things that were happening. Anyways, I haven't read it yet, but this this sounds fascinating. So if you remember March 2020, a lot of bad things happened in March 2020. At least a lot of bad things started happening. Autonomous drones have attacked humans. This is a turning point. Drone experts have long dreaded this moment. So sometime around March 2020, autonomous attack drones eliminated human beings. They're saying here it went from, you know, a futuristic sort of sci-fi thing into science fact. And they use these Cargo 2 drones, Hawk 2, to attack what seems to be retreating fighters. So that was the first time that we know of that a an autonomous drone that was fully disconnected from any operator. So they didn't have they, they weren't in communication with a human being. It was completely autonomous and cut off from any communications. So these Cargo 2 drones, what they do is they kind of are able to remotely get into this sort of swarm formation, approach the targets. And keep in mind, this is all 100% autonomous. So they can kind of swoop around like this. And then once they lock in on the target. So I'm not going to play anything that shows any human casualties, but there is a demonstration about it attacking sort of just mannequins that um, might be a little bit disturbing for people. So this is the last story on this video. So if you're not interested in seeing what this thing does, I will see you for the next one. What these drones do is they have uh, an onboard explosive. So they approach the target and trigger the explosion. Reliable at night or day, autonomously fire and forget it says. So here's a soldier setting that up in the battlefield. More of this is for testing rather. He takes off and he's able to control it, but there's also a set, set it and forget mode. So as you can see here, it picks up speed, blows up, and the shrapnel, the chunks fly, hitting the people. So here I think is a better um, illustration of what the kind of damage that it can do. And as you can see here, the uh, you can see here the shrapnel hitting the various metal, what kind of effect it has on these mannequins, on these metal on those metal sheets, etc. And so those autonomous drones, the attacks have been rising since 2020. Every year there's more and more. And now with the conflict, unfortunately, I think we're going to see a lot more of it. So with that said, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.